time. I'm just going to go through. Um, just remember, like, where we're at in the class, you know, we have, pardon my voice, it is horrible. I feel like a, uh, I don't know, you know, like that weird thing you get when you have laryngitis, but we've been talking about United States neutrality, right? And the question is, based on what you guys have seen so far and read about and attended class about, has the United States really been that neutral? And I would say probably not. Like, at least we look neutral to the rest of the world in World War II at the beginning. And I love this cartoon. Everybody, you got to copy this cartoon in your, in your notebook. You ready? There you go. you got to draw that because it's perfect. This is perfect. This is my style of parenting, actually. If I didn't see it, it didn't happen. We know something's going on, but we're not going to do anything about it. I think this, this really does typify what America's feeling in the 1930s, how they don't want to be involved with this war. Uh, but I don't know. If you kind of look at Uncle Sam, he's kind of think, he's kind of looking back then. He's kind of thinking, well, it ain't what it used to be, but at some point we might have to get involved with this thing. And so, you know, it, it is interesting. So we left off talking about neutrality acts, and we talked a little bit about how all those neutrality acts are there to kind of reinforce the idea that America should be neutral. You know, like for example, we're not gonna we're not gonna send people on ships that are bound for Europe. We're gonna make Europe come here to go um, basically drop off their stuff and also to buy their stuff or sell their stuff. Um, those are things that we can do to, to be neutral, to avoid a you know a compromising position, you know, in World War II. So there's more here. Let me get into some more. There's different movements sprouting up. <clears throat> I got to talk about these guys. The America First Committee was a group that was really committed to staying out of World War II, keeping America out of World War II. Now, I didn't say neutral, but just keeping us out of the war, actually. Um, this was made up of a variety of people. Some of them celebrities, as you can see, Charles Lindbergh is up here. You know, the famous Charles Lindbergh that flew the spirit of St. Louis all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. But what they're trying to do is to make an awareness and to lobby Congress and the president like they do. We've got to stay out of World War II um, at all costs. This, this war might be crazy, it might be hurting everybody, but if there's any possible way to make us stay out, please make us stay out. We don't want to be involved with this. It is Europe's problem, okay? So there's movements afoot. There's a commitment to neutrality acts. <clears throat> but in the face of all that, despite all of this happening, there's going to be a lot of this, and we're going to get into some of the things Hitler does. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Yeah, we knew that Japan was making aggressive aims in China, most definitely, and Southeast Asia. You know, <clears throat> I want to make something clear. That's a good point. The United States really did, I think, very much understand that all of this was going on. Here's the problem, though. Here's the problem. You remember at the end of the video on Monday, the United States military was like 200,000 people, okay? Shoot, even if we wanted to take care of these problems, there is no possible way in God's green earth that we could even like stop these nations if we wanted. Like we just couldn't do it anyway. I wonder, the more I study this stuff, if that is, a factor, and I'm thinking that it had to have been, because you have to think that our policymakers, guys, our congressmen and our president at that time, these guys were not knuckleheads, okay? They knew exactly what was going on, I think. 
it's just were we strong enough to even take a position and obviously not now I'm, I'm making a huge jump there I'm putting some words in some people's mouths but I don't think that the leaders of the country um, I don't think the leaders of the country were necessarily uh, uh, like they had all kinds of motives for trying to stay neutral. I think one of them, again, being the fact that we were so far behind militarily and we were just not going to be able to, um, to compete. Now, okay, what's going on? Fascist aggression all over the place. Um, this is kind of a recap of what happened um, and we talked about on Monday. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit about Hitler, 1933, Hitler takes over the, the, the German Reichstag, which is their government. The Nazis win a huge majority of seats. And basically by 1935, what he has done is he starts ignoring what the, what the Treaty of Versailles says. The Treaty of Versailles in 1919 said that Germany couldn't have certain things, you know, they couldn't have a certain amount of the military. Hitler says, you know, forget that. I'm going to rearm. Now, the question is, what does America do about this? Is America thinking that this is a huge problem? I mean, leaders come into power all the time. Uh, Mussolini, Benito Mussolini in Italy is attacking Ethiopia to try to regain that colony. Nations do this kind of stuff. Does the United States feel it's necessary to intervene or even, or even care? You know, of course we have a military that's very small. And also we have a, 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 a population that is very much, what's the I word at that point? Oh yeah, I see, you're catching on young Jedis, absolutely. The, uh, we are isolationists to the core. So this is going on. Yeah, we know Japan's doing their thing in, in Asia too. But, yeah, what are you going to do? I mean, you've got the Great Depression too to deal with, right? And so the New Deal, you've got to let happen. So, and, of course, America's passed their first neutrality act by the, by the mid-1930s. <laughs> After that, Hitler does even more. We've got German troops going into the neighboring area of Germany, the boundary of Germany and France. It's a little area called the Rhineland, which alarms most Europeans. But again, the United States is pretty much standing by. And frankly, Britain and France are pretty much standing by because they're in no position to do anything either. In Spain, which is kind of interesting, <coughs> there's a sort of a civil war going on there. And what you have in Spain is the forces of fascism led by a guy named General Franco, Francisco Franco, and he is supported primarily by the Nazis and the Italians. Okay, so it's like a big fascism party. I guess you could say. So all that's going on. There are some Americans that are going to fight in Spain to fight against fascism. Why are they going to Spain? They're called the Lincoln Brigade, which is kind of weird. Why are they going? They are going because, hey, it's the Depression. Anything's better than maybe staying at home and almost 2,000 Americans go and fight in Spain, which is kind of an untold story about the early parts of World War II. But this, this thing is interesting in Spain. We've got kind of a dress rehearsal for World War II. We've got the fascists on one side, and we've got the anti-fascists on the other. Who are the anti-fascists? And this is crazy. We've got the communists, right? Like Joseph Stalin and the, and the Russians are supporting people in, in, to fight against fascism in Spain. And also the United States has some troops there. Um, so it is kind of interesting that that's going on beforehand. In the end, the fascists win. Spain becomes a fascist state. 
And do you guys understand what fascism is? If you don't, here it is. Fascism is like basically extreme glorification of the military. Okay? Not just that, but wanting to return to greatness of the past. When you look at the Nazis, that's what they're doing. They are trying to recapture what makes Germany great. That's what Mussolini's doing in Italy. He's trying to recapture the glory of the Roman Empire to make a new empire. Um, you could even say that's what the Japanese are trying to do too. They're trying to just gain more power, more land, more resources and stuff. Fascism is full of symbols. The Nazi symbol is a very interesting symbol. Does anybody know where that symbol comes from? Do you know? No, go ahead. You're exactly right. It's an ancient Sanskrit word from India meaning strength or well-being, whatever you want, to, like strength or well-being. It has absolutely nothing to do with what you think it does. Symbols change over time, right? Um, and they're used for different things. That Nazi symbol, the swastika, that's an ancient, like you said, an Indian symbol. Not like Native American Indian, I'm talking, you know, Indian, okay? It's kind of like the cross. The cross is, is the symbol of Christianity today, but yet back in the day, what was the cross used for? Executions. That was supposed to be the not a quick way to die, but a horrible way to die. You know, um, so the meaning of symbols change over time. Uh, I see people with like little crosses hanging from their necks, and I'm thinking, wow, you guys are, must be into the death penalty. <laughs> no, I'm just like, no, maybe you, maybe you are. I don't know you personally, but. Okay, so fascism, again, is an extreme devotion to your country, to the nation, glorifying the military, trying to go back to the past. And Hitler's Germany is full of all this kind of stuff. Like, let's go back to the third, let's, let's create a third Reich. A Reich is a kingdom. You've got the first Reich in, early on in history, the second Reich in sort of the Middle Ages, uh, and, and getting on into the 1800s, and now you've got the third Reich. So fascism is, is that ideology, and it's totally undemocratic. It's totalitarian in nature. That's another fun word. Totalitarianism means total control of the people and of the government by the government. You know, and the Nazis are so effective at using propaganda and, and creating myths and creating stories to make people believe things that just aren't true. Yeah, there's an old saying, like, if you say things loud enough and long enough, people will start to believe it, right? It changes your mind. Like, if all we, if all we hear is a message by the government, and that's what they want us to hear, we'll start repeating it. You know what I mean? Like, you just will. It's just crazy. Like, it's like when you listen to a song on the radio and it keeps coming on. Like, everywhere you go, you can't get away from it. It just infects your mind. It's like you can't do anything about it. It's like that song, uh, All About That Bass. Like, seriously. <laughs> it's just all up in my head all the time. I had a bad dream on Saturday night. It's like, geez, what's going on, man? You can only imagine growing up in Hitler's Germany if they keep telling you Jews are the devil, Jews are the devil, Jews are the devil. Jews are the devil. Like, all... You know what I'm saying? You'll start repeating it. All right, I, I, I digressed, I'm sorry. So Hitler continues his, <coughs> excuse me, Hitler continues his um, quest for power by marching into Austria without firing a shot. That's what's called the Anschluss. Or in German, that means Union. Austria is, of course, a German-speaking country. And <clears throat> at, at that same time, shortly after that, we have the Pact, the Rome-Berlin-Tokyo Pact, also called the Axis, where you know, there's going to be an alliance of like-minded nations. 
Okay, so that's an interesting development right there. So, also in 1938, the, 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 the big problem, appeasement. This is an important concept for you. I guarantee you will see that on the quiz next week. The word appeasement, it's there. Oh my God, it's there. Appeasement. Appeasement means giving in to an aggressor in order to keep peace. And in this thing called the Munich Agreement, which they depicted in the video on Monday, Prime Minister Chamberlain from Great Britain goes down to the city of Munich, which is a beautiful city in Germany, to negotiate the terms of the treaty. And he's like, basically, Hitler, dude, what do you want? What's it gonna take for you to freaking stop taking territory? I, it's probably not what he said, but you know what I mean? He's like, man, lay it on the line. What, what do you want, man? I mean, dude, this is not cool. And Hitler's like, I want the Sudetenland, which is an area of German-speaking people in Czechoslovakia. That's what I want. Give it to me and everything. it's all good. We're, we're good. You're good. I'm good. Well, giving in, thinking that that's going to keep the peace, this is the attitude of the British. It's the attitude of the French who support the British. America not involved with this decision. Now, appeasement. Does appeasement make the aggressor more aggressive? It can, especially in Hitler's case. Yeah, what is interesting here, and I'm just going to say this because this isn't in the book, but hey, what the heck. At Munich, when Hitler was negotiating this treaty with the Brits, in Hitler's diary, it actually says that he would have backed down if the British and the French would have actually said no. He would have actually backed down. Like he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have said, I, I want this territory. He would have said, no. Uh, okay, you, you feel that way? Okay, cool. I'm not going to take this big man. Would that have avoided World War II? I don't know. But that's the fun of it. You can speculate. It's alternative history. Uh, an interesting guy who you guys, if you have like, I know you guys are college students and you have like no time, but a pretty cool um, book that you can read was about this exact thing. If the if the British and the French actually stood up to Hitler, there's this there's this writer named Harry Turtledove. It's not his real name. Harry Turtledove. He comes out with these books of alternative history, all kinds of crazy stuff that might have happened. Of course, me being a history nerd, I eat it up. You, you probably think it's boring as sin. But it is kind of interesting. Um, but he takes it pretty, pretty much farther. So Hitler takes over not just the Sudetenland in 1938, but in 1939, after that, takes over the whole area of Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> and what's interesting here, too, is as Hitler expands his empire and his territory, you've got a, a huge political change in Europe, and Hitler and Joseph Stalin signed this very important thing called the Non-Aggression Pact. Now, a little about that. What Hitler and Stalin want to do is basically put it in writing that they won't attack each other over border states. Because does anyone know what nation Hitler wants to take over to Germany's immediate east? Poland, exactly. Okay, so he wants Poland. The Soviets, they want territory too. We call it Finland. Okay. And in a few seconds, I'm going to show you guys a map. <coughs> Let me go ahead and do that to geographically kind of show you this. So this is what we've got by 1939. All the green nations are, of course, the Axis powers. 
the Soviet Union is over to the east. Um, you can see Czechoslovakia. It looks like a uh, looks like a big gallbladder right under Germany, or a small intestine, which is one of the two. Either way, it's kind of interesting. And you've got this going on. The Soviets want Finland. They want Estonia. They want Latvia, Lithuania, and the Germans want Poland. And the idea is, is that this non-aggression pact makes it so that they can attack those countries without any repercussions. And the, and the idea is also that they won't attack each other. Because what if Hitler decides to go, and I'm sure Joseph Stalin was thinking this, um, he, he certainly doesn't want Hitler to invade the Soviet Union. Of course, signing a non-aggression pact is going to make it so that he wouldn't even think about it, right? Nah. Nah, we're cool. It's on paper. Yeah, we shook on it. You know? Like, like that. And when that happens, that's a good thing. So anyways, you've got this in 1939. Now, the video showed you what America was doing in the summer of 1939. What were they doing? They had like this cool carnival, the World's Fair with all kinds of cool stuff for the future. This is when television was first introduced. Whoa, you know, it's like a box with magical video on it, kind of like your iPhone 6. And meanwhile, on September the 1st, 1939, the war begins. Look at the blood. Isn't that awesome? How did, the, how did he do that? I don't know. September the 1st, 1939, September the 1st was typically <coughs> the day when American kids are starting school. <laughs> okay, so, besides that, <laughs> the Poles wake up to find that, the, that the, the green light has been given to the German military to go in and attack Poland and Poland falls like a deck of cards. Hitler uses a new strategy called the Blitzkrieg, which is also known as Lightning War. It involves using planes, as you can see. Those are called Stuka dive bombers. Why do I know this? I don't know. But what they do is they basically bomb the living heck out of everything. And they're special planes, like the sound effects on those special planes, because they can actually go perpendicular. Is that what he's called, mathematic people? Yeah. yeah. Okay. They can actually go almost straight down and pull up in time. Very special, specialized planes. Yes, sir. They also installed the aerosol room. They were all more terrifying than right here. That's not a bomb, that's the plane. Okay, cool. I, actually, I didn't know that part. That's cool. Thanks, Jacob. Yeah, so that would definitely terrify anybody who's... I'd be terrified at the mere sight of a plane coming right at me, but bombing everything and then using these tanks, which the technology has improved since World War I, now you can go almost 50 miles an hour with tanks. German Panzer tanks, Panzer means Panther. Anyways, going in and, and basically mopping up. And, and actually, there is video, no joke, no making this up, that the Poles actually fought back against the German army with guys on horseback. My money's on the tank. You know what I'm saying? No joke, actual video. You can check it on YouTube if you want. So the Germans didn't take long to get into Poland. The Poles didn't put much up, up, up of a fight. Hitler is now going to turn his attention on Western Europe. Now, this is where it gets really hairy and really interesting, especially for our purposes of the United States. Hitler is then going to focus on Belgium. It's going to take a series of days to beat them. I mean, dude, Belgium is small. Yeah, it's half the size of Fresno County. Um, it's going to take about 18 days or so to, to, to occupy Norway, uh, basically, and then they're going to focus on France. 
to make a very, very long story short, it's going to take almost six weeks to, to destroy France. Not destroy France, but at least occupy it. And here you see some photos of Hitler marching through the streets of Paris. I can only imagine how terrifying that must have been for French people because this is their national, this is the city of light. Has anybody ever been to Paris? Been to Paris? It, yeah. You know, I mean, my God, it's like France is so awesome. It's just an awesome place to go. I mean, my God. Coffee, love, free healthcare. You know, just, mm. It's a new memorial, you know. I can only imagine what it would have been like to see those German divisions march through. And, you know, <laughs> as that guy, I think his face says it all. This <coughs> event of Germany taking over France is so significant, and I'll tell you why. Because there's a couple things. Number one, don't freak out at this picture. Okay. No, this is not a freakish genetic accident. This is Winston Churchill. Yes, and he absolutely was nicknamed the Bulldog, which is the caricature in the part two. But his, what we see here is that the, 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 the British are now by themselves. The French are immobilized. Hitler has spread both directions, east and west, and Britain's there by themselves. This is a tremendous problem. The news comes back to the United States. And what we have is a tremendous shift, and this is very important, you guys, in 1940. I can't emphasize this enough. The public opinion polls that were out at the time shifted in favor of the fact that Germany is now posing a direct threat. No longer is Germany a, a, a country that we're neutral about. You know, no longer are Americans going to start to think that this is Europe's problem. Two-thirds of Americans, two-thirds of Americans with the defeat of France changed their minds about the nature of what America should do. I, I can't emphasize how significant this is. Because if Hitler would not have taken over France, would America's opinions have shifted? And what starts to happen <clears throat> as a result, when public opinion shifts... Politicians listen, don't they? When people change their attitudes about an issue, the president, the Congress, they take note of that because guess what? They're accountable to the people, aren't they? Right? They're the ones that, ele that elect them. If two-thirds of your constituents, the people you represent, feel that Germany is a direct threat, you best be darn sure that when you campaign, that you speak to that and that you understand that. Again, this is the, sh this is the shifter right here for Americans to actually feel that this war is closer to home than it used to be. I guarantee you, this is the one thing right there. Now, Congress responds with a very important bill and I guarantee you, this is, this is significant. The very first peacetime military draft in American history, it's called the Burt Wadsworth Act, named after two senators. This authorizes the government to draft men starting at age 18 and going up to age 35 into the military to beef up our forces. Remember, our armed forces were about 200,000 at the time, at the beginning of World War II. Our senators, our president are thinking 
that <clears throat> it is very possible, however long it might take, that we will have to train millions upon millions of soldiers who have no formal training. You saw in the video, these guys are practicing. They don't even have proper training facilities for crying out loud. They're using like tomato cans full of gravel to learn how to throw grenades. I mean, are you kidding me? The German military has a military up in the nine million mark. Okay. Japan, millions too. Italy, same thing. We've got to do something. <clears throat> but this is huge. This is the first peacetime draft. So already we're a little bit late on the ball, starting to mobilize our troops and starting to get them ready. Okay? Now guess what, class? There's a difference between World War I and World War II here, especially with drafting. True or false? In World War I, America had a great number of people going to enlist in the military. False. Yeah. They did not want to fight in the, in the war. They felt the war was, the Socialist Party was big at that time. They felt the war was an unnecessary outgrowth of capitalism. It was all about greed. This war is different. This is not about greed. This is about direct threats to your livelihood. Plus, what other motive might soldiers have for enlisting in the military? You've got the depression. That's why they have no trouble recruiting guys to go into the military. Absolutely, 100%, no trouble. Guys want to go in the military. They want to fight. They want to have a job. So just remember that. Well, America is going to start shifting its emphasis to getting more and more involved. And i got to start off with this. In early 1941, after the Burke Watch attack, so here's the timeline. September 1939, we've got the attack on, on Poland. By late 1940, you've got France falling. Early 1941, the consensus is in Washington that what we must do is we must aid the nations fighting against the fascists. And you can see how much money the United States is going to lend and lease, which are two different things. Lend is called lending money, okay? Lending money directly to those nations who need it to fight against Hitler, but also leasing, which basically means building weapons here and then having ships from Great Britain or France come and get those weapons and take them back. Remember how the Great Depression ends with World War II? This is really where it ends, right here. Because now you've got so many people going back to work in the factories. War puts us up, puts our GDP up as we begin to, um, <coughs> excuse me, lend and lease. Notice that we're giving money to the Soviet Union too. Oh, interesting. You know why? Because they're our friends. Yes, the Soviet Union, home of Joseph Stalin, guy who killed 20 million people of his own kind. He even had his own wife killed, according to who you ask. Anyways, look at our allies too, lots of them. So America benefiting from this. I don't know, neutral? Meh, 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 maybe not. I'll talk about this. <coughs> the Atlantic Charter. In mid-1941, Winston Churchill meets with um, uh, Roosevelt off the coast of what is Canada today. It's called Newfoundland. Okay? They meet in an aircraft carrier. And what they do is they come up with nothing short of an alliance. It's called the Atlantic Charter. What this does is it 
lists a bunch of common aims in case America gets involved in a war. One of those aims is to rid the world of Nazi aggression. I don't know about you, that doesn't sound very neutral to me. But that's what the United States does. And I think Roosevelt had a number of things going on here. He wanted to make sure that the United States was part of making a deal with Great Britain to keep that alliance strong because, let's just face it, France is shot, you know. The Soviet Union, are they trustable even though we're giving them money? I mean, they're communists, for crying out loud. Great Britain is our best bet for an alliance here. So, <clears throat> and Churchill obviously wants America's money, America's weapons, and this is a way of solidifying that alliance. Now we get to the interesting stuff. Not that any of that wasn't interesting. December the 7th, 1941, we have the attack on Pearl Harbor. This attack took place on a Sunday morning. I should know because I've seen the movie. No, I'm just kidding. I, I know it anyway. I actually took my wife there when we were dating on our third date. We left. It was so long. Too much making out of in the, in the movie. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry to say that. Anyways, the Pearl Harbor was the Japanese surprise attack. Or was it a surprise? Yes, there is so much controversy about Pearl Harbor. Okay, let's dig into that just for fun. In your book, they have a whole section about Pearl Harbor. Was Pearl Harbor a manufactured event by the United States government to get the United States into the war? Or was it more of a surprise attack by the Japanese? There are debates on both sides. And I can honestly tell you it's very hard in history sometimes to make a, a judgment like that. You have to look at all the sides together. There's compelling arguments on both sides. But we'll go with that in just a second. Yes, sir. Considering the fact that the Japanese aircraft carrier was passed over the airport, Justin, uh, what did the airplane range of yeah. Pearl Harbor was there any pre-Asian before the Japanese FDR knew that nothing was stopping? Right. And this point, the whole thing is that the Pearl Harbor was set up. Yeah, yeah, it's a guy to take care of the cap. Go ahead. That's just a shot. That is true, too, which is the fun of this. Okay. It, True, yes. Again, compelling arguments. Yes. So, what you're saying, the point of this is that, oh, it manufactured the America into the war, but after the fall of France, America was ready for the war because they thought it was already threatened, and they don't need more support. Well, he, here's what we know, and here's what we can say for sure. Okay, and, and your book does a pretty, really good job of it. The facts are simple. As Japan started to become more powerful and start to look for more resources in Southeast Asia, um, the United States basically did what they're doing to Cuba right now. It's called an embargo. America decided, hey, we're not going to trade with Japan anymore. We're not going to sell um, oil, especially. Our exports are not going to go to Japan because, of course, Japan needs that oil. So. <clears throat> there were negotiations to try to negotiate some kind of deal because Japan doesn't have those resources. 
So if Japan doesn't have those resources, they're going to have to get them from somewhere. And where is Japan going to look? Japan's going to look to Southeast Asia to try to get all the all of those resources. And there's plenty of oil there. They're going to look to the East Indies, which is today Indonesia. There's plenty of oil there. America and the Japanese are not going to cut a deal about you know peace. Japan's not going to get what it wants, and so it is going to take revenge. Okay. Now the question is, it's kind of like Watergate in a little bit, but how much did the president know, and when did he know it? Again, there is, you know, depending on who you ask, and there's documentaries on this stuff, like if you're really bored tonight, watch them on YouTube. They're very interesting. The BBC does a pretty good documentary on it. it there are those who say that like you, some of you are saying, the fleet was near. Roosevelt knew the positions of the Japanese fleet. Roosevelt knew what was going on. He wanted there to be, um, they wanted the Japanese to fire the first shot. Because if, if America fires the first shot and goes after the Japanese, that's going to make us look bad, right? In fact, let me quote, one of our leaders at this point, <clears throat> where he basically says, um, and I'm going to paraphrase, one of the leaders of the American military is like, how do you get them to fire the first shot? Just think about it for a second. If you're President Roosevelt, and I'm playing devil's advocate here, this is the fun part. If you're President Roosevelt, what do you have to gain? Seriously, by having the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor or anywhere. What do you gain by that? What's going to happen? Is it going to help you? Is it going to help you in your re-election campaign? You know what I'm saying? Like, because you're going to have to go to re-election. Is it going to help you unify the country? You know, and is it going to help stimulate the economy? Is it going to, yeah, again, is it going to help people get involved in the military, right? Any normal person would think, yeah, that's pretty compelling. And then again, there are those who believe, based on all kinds of evidence, that this was indeed a surprise attack. Me personally, I'm in the middle. I see both sides. I can see how it's possible. We'll never know. You know, if I go to heaven and I ask God, which I believe in, not saying you guys have to, I'm not church and state here, I'm going to ask God like three things. Did you kill Jan? <laughs> Did Roosevelt know that Pearl Harbor? And number three, the aliens really exist. And that's pretty much what I'm going to ask you. Oh, I got a fourth one. What's on the 18 and a half minutes of Watergate tape? That's what I want to know. Four things. I don't care about them. But there are, those are my four. Those are my four right there. I just got to know. I don't want to know anything else. Now, how sad is that? Going through my mind. I know, right? Go ahead. I had a old history teacher in high school that believed that the Japanese was like the assassination of JFK. And he says, <laughs> you never know. You never know, right? I mean, my goodness. There's so much stuff that's untold, which is so beyond, like, the academic stuff. Like, And it makes for good media, right? Like, it makes people want to watch stuff like the History Channel, like the untold stories and this and that. Yeah. Right. So she always looks at me and watch them. Thank you. Well, you know, that's cool. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to give you one way or the other. I, I'm just going to put it out there. Just be familiar with those arguments, you know, because who knows? Um, it might be on the quiz there. The, the, the main guy that come, came up with that argument is a guy named Charles Beer. And he's in, he's in your book, too. 
but but those arguments have gone back, they've gone forth. You know, it, with any conspiracy theory, there's always you know stuff like that. The the irrefut the irrefutable facts are, as you look at some different images. There's one of your admirals there. I'm not going to say too much about him. These are just pictures of kind of the destruction. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I'm trying to lose weight. Um, so this this battle actually, I'm sorry, killed over 2,000 Americans. It basically sank most of our fleet in the Pacific. Heck, even two days after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese carried out another raid against the Philippines where we had even more ships stationed and they wiped out our fleet uh, for a good long time. <laughs> That's what a lot of people don't actually know. But in the end, what Pearl Harbor did is it caused us to declare war. Um, <clears throat> and like nothing ever before, it, it caused a sense of unity among Amer Americans. If they were on the fence about getting involved in this in this war to start out with, they're not going to be on the fence anymore. This is going to tip pretty much everybody, except one person in Congress, and I told you about her, her name's Jeanette Rankin. She was the first female to be elected into the into the United States House of Representatives. She was from Wyoming, of all places. Anyways, first woman, she was the only no book to go to war with Japan. Otherwise, it was totally unanimous. And she, and she had the she claimed that this was all a big conspiracy. Of course, she was a pacifist too. Did that have something to do with it? Pearl Harbor also. <clears throat> was granted uh, Roosevelt's declaration of war and here's another thing to think about and I know I'm going way beyond if I'm Hitler I've got to be thinking Japan what a bunch of knuckleheads you know why just think about it America is the sleeping giant, right? If America is allowed to get involved in this war, and you knuckleheads have bombed it, what is wrong with you people? You should not get the United States a chance to mobilize their forces because they're protected by two oceans, right? Atlantic and Pacific, and all they have to do is readjust their economic system from producing Model Ds to producing tanks and bombs and guns. And there's nothing we can do to stop them. It's not like we're going to be able to fly across the Atlantic and bomb them. It's not like Japan's going to be able to do that. Even though they got close, I guess. The Japanese were actually firing at us up in Oregon. Did you know that? They, the, the Nazis were actually sinking ships off of the coast of New Jersey. I don't know if you knew that. But it's like, I, if I'm Hitler, I've got to be thinking, geez, you know, I want to attack Britain. I want to get the Soviet Union. What are you doing, guys? Geez, you're killing me, Smoltz. So, oh, I thought you were. No, just... You know, think about that for a second. Yeah. That is true. The Japanese parliament, the War Party, ended up taking over the parliament prior to Pearl Harbor, and yes, Hideki Tojo was the leader of that War Party, and yes. He had an expansionist mindset to be more aggressive, an aggressive tone against the United States. And so, yeah, it could be argued that that might have had it. So Japanese politics is maybe to at work here, too. <coughs> That's true. The, 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 yeah, you, you are exactly right. 
So again, in every country, there's internal politics which drive the politicians, and that's obviously what happened. Yes, comment. Go ahead. In the book, uh, it states that Yes. Just a militaristic stance, you know. The, and from their perspective, it's like, hey, they're probably thinking, hey, public opinion is behind us. Let's take it over. But there are no consequences. You know, and, and that's not the first time that kind of stuff has happened before. Excuse me as I attempt to... Uh, all right, so the next thing, <clears throat> um, so the next thing is pretty much this. After this, and you can see Franklin Roosevelt signing the war declaration, of course, um, Pearl Harbor is a national historic site today where you can go and see um, the USS Arizona which I'm going to show you right here. That has anybody ever been there? It's actually the bottom. Have you seen it? You're supposed to live there. Go on. You go on with yourself. That's awesome. <laughs> Hawaii is a place that uh, I would probably never go. And my wife lets me know about it. Anyways, pretty cool stuff uh, for history people, and I understand it is still leaking water. I gotta, I gotta get to Hawaii. So I, gotta see. I gotta do a study trip. You guys can all donate to the Mr. Bird Fund in case you want to. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm all ears. Okay. Wow. Interesting. Cool. I would love to go. Like, again, I would love to go. Not going to happen, though. That's too much money. Anyways, um, so <clears throat> I'm going to do sort of like the big ideas of World War II. Don't worry. You're not going to be tested on, on little battles, okay? Like, don't even stress about that. Please, I, every time I do this unit, I'd like just you know, let's not let's not kill ourselves over who won this and who won that because that's not the point. The point is is that you guys should understand the broad strategy here. If you look at the Axis in 1942, and you see the big red areas here, if you're the United States generals, you're thinking that. You're going to attack the nation that poses the bigger threat to world security. And that, of course, is going to be the Germans. You're going to go after the Germans first. I mean, by 1942, they have invaded the Soviet Union. They have started to bomb Great Britain in the Battle of Britain. They have pushed up into Norway. They have pushed up into... Finland even. And what's interesting about that, Hitler always talked about, oh, you know, I want Lebensraum, I want land. And I'm like, you know what, that's ridiculous. What they really wanted is land that has resources on it. If you don't know anything about this area of the world where Hitler is taking over, know this. There's a ton of natural gas resources in Russia. There's a ton of oil in Russia. If the, if the Axis can get control into the Middle East, too, as you can see, they're kind of dipping down there in Turkey, kind of close to there. They can hook up the uh, a lot of the oil wells and stuff. And so, you know what? This isn't just a war about ideology, about killing Jews and stuff. War is about resources. I'm sorry, it just is. I mean, look at Japan. Japan, down in the in Southeast Asia, there's not only oil, there's also rubber, there's also uh, 
other resources, timber, palm oil, all kinds of stuff. And, and really, all of that is masked in this ideology that we need labor to throw out. You know, we need living space. It's like, yeah, okay. I guess you do. But at the same time, you know, resources. So Germany is the greater threat. In Europe, the strategy is basically going to be simple. <coughs> We're going to attack the Axis up in North Africa uh, first. I'm sorry, let me go back. And we're also going to, um, <laughs> this is kind of stupid, but I'll just tell you, kind of tickle the, the underbelly of Europe there with Italy, the, the soft underbelly they call it. Meanwhile, the Russians are going to try to push from the east. And the Americans, with the help of the Brits and the French, because some of the French troops were able to escape, which I didn't go into too much, um, and attack Germany in the middle. And that's going to be essentially how World War II is going to be won. That's the basic strategy. The most famous battle that takes place is, of course, the D-Day invasion on June 6th, 1944, where basically Americans and British troops are going to, en masse, invade the beaches of France in order to push the Germans in and, and to gain the beachhead. And what that's going to do is the largest land invasion in the history of the planet. It's going to basically be a significant turning point. Because after this, the Germans aren't going to be able to hold the line against Western encroachment anymore. Before that, I, I just want to go back to this slide. Before that, in between the years of 1942 and 1943, the Russians helped push the Germans back. And one thing that really messed the Germans up was the Russian winter. As the Germans pushed farther and farther and farther, they almost got to the capital there, which is Moscow. You see that? Like right up in the top. They almost get there, but the Russian winter comes. And it not only, it, it basically kills their ability to use their tanks. And the Russians have like this special tank called the T-34. It's pretty cool. It runs on snow. Not runs on snow, but it, what I mean is it, it's able to go. No, but, and the Russians also have troops on skis and stuff. The Germans are freezing their tails off. It's kind of like Empire Strikes Back, you know, the snow battle with the walkers, except minus the walkers. It's like that. Okay. You guys aren't Star Wars fans, so I'm all with you. No, I'm just kidding. No, but uh, the, the, the Russians have really done a, a lot of work, and so the Americans, it's up to them. As the Americans come in, the tide of war is going to start to, to shift. I also want to spend some time talking about this um, focal point here. Um, instead of this, I mean, I think, I don't want to go over this too much, but just understand, war is full of lots of <coughs> turning points and changes and things that can happen as a result of <coughs> tremendous mobilization. The D-Day landing is by, by far one of the most amazing things to ever happen in the war. To, to actually fool the Germans into <laughs> thinking that an attack may have been coming from a different place on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a horrible day, you know, on a choppy day, going across the English Channel right here. If I, I'm sorry, if I go back, going across the English Channel there, and I, I've been across the English Channel. It's only like maybe 19 miles at its, at its longest, but it's choppy water and it's cold as heck. I mean, my goodness gracious. To have all of these troops get across that, essentially not completely undetected by the Germans, but almost undetected, is a tremendous feat in and of itself. I encourage you guys to check it out whenever you can. I'm sorry, go ahead, Susie. Uh, my grandfather was in the Navy. Oh. And he said the, uh, the reason why he left was mm -hmm. when they go on the side of the road and Oh, 
Oh my gosh, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's crazy. He talks about it all the time, so it's uh, he's, he's he's around. Yeah, yeah, pushing around the tree. Oh my goodness. But yeah, he talks about it all the time. He actually told me he cares for me when I said it was not for me, so it's like okay. <laughs> Wow, okay. So yeah, maybe, interesting. Does anyone else have any family, friends, people you know that were in World War II? Wow. Okay, cool. Okay. Okay, interesting. So some of you guys, awesome. You know, um, and, and World War II veterans are getting older. Like you say, your grandfather's 93. And so, you know, that's obviously something to keep in mind as, as you know, we are, World War II veterans are getting seriously older. There was an effort a couple of years ago by, um, I think, Madera High School to do something where they documented everybody that they could find within the area that fought in World War II to have to do like an oral history project to just interview the guys while they're still alive. Because the reality is, is that they're getting up there in age and Certainly, we don't want to lose their stories. So, if, if you know a veteran or something, you know, talk to them, tell them their stories. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I want to spend a time, a little bit of time on this, the Holocaust. I, I, I'm sure many of you are obviously familiar with the Holocaust, it's the killing of six million Jews, the killing of homosexuals, the killing of people undesirable, the physically and mentally handicapped in, in Germany. Um, they're also, in, in the United States, the question we come up a lot uh, against a lot is, did the United States know about the Holocaust? And the answer is, <coughs> I think, yes and no. It's yes in that the United States did know um, that certain things were happening to the Jews, okay? Did they know about the, the camps? I think they did. I just don't think they knew about the extent to which the camps were significant killing factories. But America, you know, sometimes people ask, well, couldn't America have done some things to try to just attack these death camps to try to stop them from killing so many Jews? And the prevailing attitude, I'll get to your question in a second, the prevailing attitude by the United States government was they didn't actually want to bomb these camps and to destroy them. Uh, because they were not significant targets. That's at least what the military said. So I want you guys to understand that. Again, did we know about things happening to Jews in Germany? Yeah. The extent of which? You know. Okay, go ahead. Well, when uh, American soldiers first came upon the, the concentration camp, they were completely taken aback about how brutal and how disgusting True. the soldiers were to the people and not just. That could be true. That's an interesting point. Um, yes. Yes. It does. That that no, you're exactly right. High level people in the government, some of them were anti-Semitic in nature, feeling that um, just an internal prejudice against Jews. As we learned in the video on Monday, uh, Roosevelt did turn away the St. Louis, which was a ship full of Jews, um, because he didn't want to give special treatment to Jews at the expense of everybody else. And so, yeah, um, it's easy to look back with our 2015 eyes and go, you know, what were they thinking here, right? But when you have anti-Semitic people in power and and all of the other things, it, it is it, 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 it is interesting that, that that happened that way. I thought you were going to say something about um, it. Did also be because we weren't close by that in the 
I know, like, personally, <coughs> I've been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and up until that point did I ever really understand. It was the most powerful, one of the most powerful buildings in the ground zero. Yeah, and, and I've been to the ground zero, but I haven't been to that one, but I've been to the Museum of Tolerance in L.A., and that's pretty serious, too. Uh, yeah, I I do think America knew to some extent what was going on. I don't think they knew, and like I say, the, the soldiers, when they came to the death camps, I mean, this is what they found, right? I mean, they found mass graves, they found this, they saw this. Here's a disgusting picture, and I don't want to spend too much time on that, but this is the kind of stuff they found. Did they know the extent of this that was going on? Obviously not. Was it broadcast? No, of course not, because the Germans were very good at keeping all that stuff a secret. Uh, you're, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, when I was in Germany, they actually got down the wall to get there. And one of them um, has, uh, they have a whole bunch of uh, selected items from the people who were in the camp. Not, but there's one museum that we went to, and it's a huge room, and it goes back. gas chamber. Wow. The Museum of Tolerance has something similar to that as well. Yes? How many people know how the Germans were doing this behavior since the Germans that took all the family can see things that the Germans changed the entire time. True. The Germans, Japan would do the same thing. Yes. So, not many people know that. They always think there's just this link. No, and, and what you're talking about is is a couple different things there, and this is for all of us. It's called the Rape of Nanking. The German or the Japanese did that to, to the Japanese provincial capital of Nanking in 1937. They raped thousands of women. They killed, they killed women and children. Um, the Japanese also had secret science experiments going on. Um, Unit 731 was what it was called in Manchuria, where they were. Where they were basically do some of the stuff that Nazis were doing to Jews, like basically testing the resistance to heat, to cold, kinds of weird scientific experiments. Yeah, they, they, yeah that's true. Um, because, the, what, yeah, and some people don't know this, the Japanese were actually involved in their own way, as Hitler was kind of on this racial crusade to rid the world of Jews, the Japanese saw themselves as higher than Chinese, who they consider to be their lynch, which is like subhumans. So yeah, you know, both nations kind of have this sort of racial ideology going on, um, which is part of World War II, which is war. Um, in terms of us, the Pacific theater, so the European theater is defeating Germany. And I'm only going here because I want to make sure we finish it, but the Pacific Theater is basically where we have the war against Japan. <clears throat> and you can see kind of like how the warfare is going to be a little bit different. Now one thing that's interesting to note is we are going to take out Germany first and devote lots of resources there, but 
beginning in 1941 and up until um, seriously starting in 1942, he'll do a simultaneous offensive against the Japanese. And this is known as island hopping. Okay? And that's going to be the only way to go against Japan. The military strategists obviously understood that what we were going to have to do to defeat them is take island after island. And these battles were going to be just horribly nasty. Because the Japanese, of course, were going to fight to the death. They were instructed by their emperor to fight to the death. Even to the point where women and children are seen jumping off of cliffs to their death on Iwo Jima and Okinawa, rather than be captured by Japanese, by American troops. Okay, so surrendering to the death, and the, again, these battles will be absolutely horrific, and some of the bloodiest fighting and, and toughest fighting in the war. Now, very last thing we'll talk about, but, I'm sorry, but the very last thing we'll talk about, without getting, again, too much into the battle part of it, just understand that that's our strategy, island hopping. When we have, <clears throat> by 1939, I must tell you, by 1939, you guys thought that was cool, huh? There it is. By 1939, um, it is widely known from uh, Specifically, scientists that have gotten out of Germany that Germany is trying to develop an atomic bomb. Well, what you have in America is a top secret project called the Manhattan Project, which I'm sure a lot of you know about. And trying to develop an atomic bomb using radioactive materials such as uranium and plutonium and stuff like that. And in New Mexico, they have succeeded in, in conducting nuclear tests to see if this weapon is actually going to work, should it need to be used. Here's the deal. President Roosevelt dies in 1945, right at the beginning. He's succeeded by a guy named Harry Truman, who was the vice president. Harry Truman has absolutely no clue that they've developed this thing. And by July of 1945, after America has taken all the islands, basically, and is massing a, a huge amount of troops ready to invade Japan and bomb the living stuffing out of it, because that's what we're going to do, he becomes aware that we have this technology. Okay? He becomes aware that we have this technology. Now, Harry Truman, I'll show you these, these things and talk about this a little bit. Harry Truman is mulling over the possibility of perhaps using these bombs. And I gotta go over with you his thought process. Um, of course, on Tinian Island, which is basically where the B-52s are going to be able to to drop the bombs, of course the bombs were dropped from the from the cockpit of the Enola Gay, which is basically the, the name of the ship that's going to drop. The, the, the two bombs are those, Little Man, Little Boy, and Fat Man. Little Boy is the first one that's going to be dropped on Hiroshima. Fat Man is going to be the second one that's going to be dropped on Nagasaki. Harry Truman is thinking, okay, I've got this bomb. Should I use it? Because here's what will happen if I do use it, I think. If I use the bomb, <clears throat> I'm going to be able to save American lives. Because again, the Japanese won't surrender. And I'm going to save a million men and not prolong this war anymore. Okay? Number two, I can show the Soviets, who I don't trust, because frankly, I just had a meeting with Joe Stalin, and he's a real son of a gun. I don't like him. And I know they're not going to play fair once this war is over. Because they're communists. And do communists play, play fair? No. I want to show him what's up. I want to show him that we have this bomb. 
If he doesn't drop the bomb, imagine the consequences. If he doesn't drop the bomb, what would have happened? Would America have sent in more and more troops and more losses of life? Ultimately, the prevailing viewpoint is that President Truman dropped the bomb. I'll show you a picture of the bomb here. On Hiroshima to shorten the war and to save American lives. That's what the gold standard is for what your book is going to say. That's the, that's the accepted view. There are some historians out there that don't buy it. There are some people that think Harry Truman didn't mean to drop the bomb. In fact, what they could have done is two things. They could have taken the bomb out 20, 30 miles outside of Tokyo within range, and they could have dropped it, and they could have said, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't surrender. They could have. <laughs> There's people that think that. There's also people that think Harry Truman didn't have to drop the bomb because the Japanese were probably maneuvering politically inside their government to surrender anyway. So there's, and, and all it would have taken was another three weeks. So there's different viewpoints on the issue. Again, I'm not going to tell you what to think. Just be, just understand what the prevailing viewpoint is. Okay. All right, that's a lot for today. We're going to stop there. We'll see you on Monday. Where was it at? It was in Berlin. I can't okay. remember.